Okay, Dennis, what do you think? Ready to go? Okay, you ready? Yep, I think we got everybody that's, uh, that is registered. Yep, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if, uh, thanks for uh, joining in in the uh, participation in this project. Uh, it's been uh, two years in the making and we're finally getting down to actually being able to implement uh, all of the planning that's been going on. So if we could proceed to the next slide, please. Uh, these are our collaborators and partners uh, from, that all started with uh, Chris Elphick at uh, UConn, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Field, who is with us today to uh, also help out with uh, some of the information and the documents later on. So uh, uh, welcome aboard, Chris. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Juliana is the other person, Juliana Barrett has been the other key person that's actually uh, come down and worked with Dennis and me, picking out the sites uh, where things would be done. This whole program began with, uh, from, um, with a contact from Dave Kozak from DEP, uh, who uh, was the uh, coastal, uh, coastal planner. And uh, he wanted to develop a, gr a grant proposal uh, to get a, uh, what's called a SLAM model uh, prepared, which is supposed to show the possible impacts of uh, sea level rise over the span of, of uh, between now and, and 2100. Uh, Patrick Lynch has provided uh, um, a whole lot of the uh, the slides and, and pictures and so forth, some of which will be in the uh, presentation today. And uh, from, he is also going to be helping out with the identification of the organisms and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, Roman Zajac, uh, from, who I initially had contact with, has retired. Uh, from, and so we've, um, uh, I've been trying to reach out to him and he hasn't gotten back to me. Uh, Scott is with us today. Uh, Thanks for your help, Scott. You're welcome. How are you? You're doing, you're doing great. <laughs> and uh, Susie Huminski from, uh, from Southern, who is actually uh, Bo and uh, Zane's uh, daughter. Uh, and it's Bo and Zane that are providing us uh, the barn to use as our base of operations. And then, of course, Dennis and John Picard. Uh, Dennis is our host, and John Picard is uh, Vice President of our organization, who is also from kind of uh, from organizing the, the, the bird studies um, on all of this. So, next slide, please. Uh, we do have Robert Prezant, who is uh, 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 the Vice President of Academic Affairs at uh, Southern. Right now, he's uh, over his head and trying to get to uh, keep the program going the start of the start of the new school year so um, uh, we've got Scott with us we've got Derek uh, Scott Tucker is going to be a videographer with us uh, Luke are you on board now no Carol Sharon is with us Diane uh, Jim Shea has expressed an interest uh, he's not with us uh, Steve Broker is um, not going to be able to do the field work with us, but uh, has uh, been uh, providing some information to John. He said he was going to try and uh, line up some other people to to be part of the program. And uh, uh, you can see the rest of the people that are there. This is going to be our overall team that we will be working with uh, once we actually get out to work in the field. So, next slide, please. Here is the statement of the problem. <clears throat> According to there is uh, <clears throat> back in uh, in 2018, there was a public act that was passed concerning climate change planning and resiliency. 
that gave some uh, con consideration to identifying the impacts of such increased flooding and erosion on infrastructure and natural resources. Our bar from the East River Marsh uh, was, uh, and it was decided that the East River Marsh is going to be one of the key areas that Dave Kozak was interested in uh, doing some research and also reaching out to people who might be affected by sea level rise and trying to decide what was going to be done with their properties. Uh, from, after some discussion, it, uh, we realized that uh, there was going to be a need to do some monitoring to, uh, to show you know, what was actually happening and uh, correlating that with uh, what goes on in the SLAM model. The projected sea level rise is 20 inches by uh, 2050. That's a little less than, it's a four inches less than uh, uh, two foot rulers added on top of each other. Does not seem like much, however, uh, from, it's going to continue to rise after that up to a total of perhaps 72 inches uh, by, from, by 2100. Um, if it does go up six feet, then we have some major problems. Uh, the question is how much will the marshes uh, complex uh, be able to migrate inland to create new marshland habitat where the birds, insects, wildlife, and forage fish will be able to survive. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a sequence which will show where the, uh, the different levels of the marsh of are going to be. Uh, the green represents a low marsh, uh, the gold, high marsh areas, the blue open water, and then uh, tidal flats, which uh, from, from are subject to you know, the rise and fall of the tides. Uh, this is 2010, that's, and that's uh, 2100. Uh, showing the uh, showing the transition that it's going to be taking place, and by 2100, the whole area will be tidal flats, which will be you know, which will be um, uh, the blue represents the areas that's going to be flooded, and if you noted on the um, on the uh, on the right side at 2100, um, that whole area north of 95 is the area that we're going to be particularly concerned about is for the areas that uh, the marsh may be able to migrate into. Next slide, please. The purpose of these studies, two things. Examine the vegetation changes within at the edges of the coastal marshes. And two, examine the responses of the animal populations to these changes. The issue here is, as uh, there's only a very limited area that the marshes are able to migrate into. So we've um, had originally selected three sites, but uh, we've only been able to narrow it down to, to one site where these uh, studies are going to be made this time around, and that's in the area of, uh, of the uh, Guilford Salt, Mar Salt Meadow Sanctuary. Uh, the animal populations of um, that uh, has to do with uh, the birds and the food for the birds. Uh, so that's what our folk, our, our, um, our wildlife part of this study is going to be focusing on. Any questions on the purpose? Next slide, please. <laughs> uh, these studies are being carried out. Uh, to determine the correlation between the SLAM model, which is the computer generated model in these plant and animal community, uh, uh, communities. And the period of time is between now and 2100. So this is the, this is the, this is the first, uh, first session of many to come, I hope. Uh, the, the area, this is the area in, uh, in the marsh of uh, and uh, there's that projection that comes out into the stream. Uh, if you move back into where the tufts of grass are, and uh, from, yep, and move to the right, right in that area where the pointer is now, is uh, where the uh, the origin of our first transect uh, line is um, has been set out. So, next slide. 
Uh, we need to understand uh, what it, uh, what are the zones in the of, uh, in the tidal wetlands and marsh myco uh, marsh ecology. Uh, all of the things that are going on here in terms of uh, weather and and the plants and animals and the rising and falling of the tides and the change in temperature and the salinity of the water are all going to affect uh, all of the plants and animals in this area. So that's why we have to do this assessment. Next slide. This shows the various regions of the marsh of and uh, beginning with the, with the shoreline. Uh, we move into the low marsh and up on the side of the, if, um, the up on the right up on the right side of the of um, uh, the diagram, it lists the types of plants and so forth. It would um, be the, in, the, you know, the, the inhabitants of, of that particular area. So this is where you will have to begin to learn and, and study up on, on uh, for, to be able to identify the types of plants that are there uh, as you move across. So here are some examples that are shown to you here in this diagram. And this is uh, produced by uh, Patrick Lynch. And it's uh, one of the th one of the diagrams. It's actually in, in the field guide, which will be part of your part of the toolkits that uh, we'll have uh, to take out into the field with us uh, to do these identifications. So, next slide. As I mentioned earlier, the interactions and interrelationships. You got the atmosphere, the lithosphere weathering and erosion and deposition, especially the deposition that occurs in the, in the marsh areas is uh, the plants and so forth uh, trap all of this and all of the silt and sediments that are washed down by the, uh, by the increasing weather systems that we're having. This kind of gives uh, an overall view of types of plants and animals that make up the uh, energy web and the food web in the marsh. And uh, when, it gets, when it comes to the point of birds, there are those that are residents of the area. And then there are those that are migrating through uh, at uh, different times of the year. And that's partly why we're doing these studies uh, once in the spring and once in the fall. Uh, the session next week is our first fall study session. What is a transect line study and how is it being used? It's a method used to determine the location and distribution of plant and animal communities. We make use of a 100 meter long of, uh, of uh, measuring tape, which is uh, stretched out um, uh, between two pins. Uh, we've already designated uh, of, you know, where those pins are from. Uh, have been placed. Uh, we did that uh, you know, a short time ago. Uh, placing along that tape at various intervals will be a one meter square quadrant. Uh, it's a it's a frame that's a meter on a meter on all sides, uh, and we'll be providing more information about that shortly. Let's determine the kinds of plants that are living in the quadrants in their relative abundance in the quadrant. <coughs> Along that 100 meter stretch, we'll actually be taking uh, 32 <coughs> quadrant samples. And as I indicated before, it'll be done twice a year, once in the <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> Dennis, yeah. Okay. Um, the studies conducted in the spring and fall. Uh, this will enable a research team to determine how much and how fast the marsh uh, habitat is migrating into upland areas and potentially become new, uh, of, uh, new and sustainable marshland areas. The data which we collect will then be matched up with the, uh, the SLAM projections 
which uh, you saw uh, in, 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 in a previous slide there with uh, showed the different areas of the, uh, the marsh that will be uh, uh, impacted. Next. In this slide, this is uh, the area that we will actually be uh, from, uh, be doing in up in the top. Uh, there's a little red line that extends from uh, the, the lower part of our uh, from our salt meadow out into into the marsh. Uh, can you point that out, uh, Dennis, with a pointer? Uh, no, no, I won't, won't go in there. Okay. Well, if you, hopefully you can make out that red line that extends from from the field out into out into the marsh there, if, um, and that's the hundred meter stretch there. With that's it. Yep. Uh, that's it right there. Yep. And the next slide is a close up of of that whole area. And basically, it extends from where the if, uh, where the split is in the incoming uh, stream and uh, goes up into where those uh, those shrubs are. Yep, all through that area. That's it. Yep. Okay, the technique that we're using is uh, this is the this is the uh, the simple. Uh, the protocols and what this big you know, this is a uh, document which uh, both Chris Field and Chris Elpik and uh, uh, and so forth uh, developed for the studies that were when you began these when Chris in uh, 2014. Yeah, I think that's right. We I think we uh, did the first survey in 2015. Yep. Uh, so in the pile of documents which you have, uh, if you could refer to uh, uh, that one, that basically gives you the, uh, the general overall of uh, how we're, you know, from, you know, how we're going to be proceeding with this. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we'll be conducting line transect studies. Each transect line, there will be six groups of people who will be carrying out the observations simultaneously. Uh, one of the groups will be making the observations, the aquatic organisms, and this will be done in the creek right near the uh, zero end of the line transect. The zero end of the line transect has been uh, inset uh, two meters away from what is the, uh, the edge of the creek. And, uh, and it'll be out, it'll be in the waters and on the banks and so forth, out beyond that to where we'll be uh, collecting the aquatic organisms and uh, plants and animals to, for that assessment. <clears throat> Second group will be working on a bird survey uh, from around the line transect, and those um, procedures are outlined uh, later on. There will also be three groups which will be doing the quadrant sampling in accordance with uh, the guidance uh, shown later. And then there will be uh, another group of uh, two or maybe three people, which will be working with uh, Scott um, on, on the drone and doing the documentation and the documentation of the vegetation and the changes that are actually taking place in the, in the marsh over, for, over a period of time. So uh, these are the basic breakdowns of um, uh, of our entire group, which we will need people to uh, carry out those functions. Next, a typical uh, research team would have a research coordinator, and then there would be the three subgroups. Uh, one person will be the sample observer and collector of, of whatever samples that, uh, that we need to take one of to be for future reference. And a person who could be the identification specialist and photographer. 
and the other who would be the data recorder and uh, mapping specialist. So. <clears throat> uh, this is the georeferencing um, uh, procedure, which uh, we, uh, we basically have already done uh, to lay out the, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the metal pins. Uh, which mark the zero and uh, from and uh, from 100 meter marks. Uh, we've also put in uh, some um, marking stakes at the uh, 25 meter, the 50 meter, and the 100 meter uh, from a plot, so that uh, when we go back next week and actually stretch out the tape uh, between the points, uh, we'll know where to. Um, help align the, the, the tape along along the edge of the of the vegetation that we'll be doing the studies on. Next, uh, this is a data sheet which we will have to fill out uh, at the time we actually do the studies. It's mainly we're going to recording the data from this. And uh, question for you, Chris Field, is. Uh, the information we get from uh, from the cell phones in terms of uh, of uh, latitude and longitude and uh, GPS bearings and so forth um, is that going to be suitable? I am not prepared to answer that question. I don't know. Can, um, that's a good question. Can I pipe in here a little bit? This is Scott Graves. Please. Yep. Go ahead. Um, I think um, you know if this is really going to be a, a good long term study. It might be worth it to uh, to rent a precision uh, GPS from uh, a surveying company. I forget the name of the. There's a local surveying company that that rents out and leases out precision GPS, and we have some students that have a little bit of experience with that. Um, I'm not sure if they're still around and they graduated, but if we could get a couple of locations on the marsh. Um, staked out that we could uh, revisit um, with we just need precision gps once but if there are permanent stakes left out then um, that would be great because i could make them visible on the on the drone ortho mosaic and that thing could then be locked into real world coordinates the ortho mosaic and the 3d model for the for the whole marsh could be locked down to real world, real world coordinates if we had uh, a couple of good GPS points. That would be perfect. Uh, you, you and I uh, try and talk later. And we'll uh, see see who that is and what arrangements we can make. Yeah, or you know, if uh, if Chris up at stores has a precision GPS unit, or uh, we, we'll figure it out. But yep. um, doesn't yep. have to be right away. It's just that we need those. those we need that information to stay on the market. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well. yeah. I would just add that when we when we took GPS coordinates. We weren't using them to ever go back to to refine the transects. If we if we had to retry find a transect, we would put something in the ground or something on a tree. Um, right. So, and if we if we did take the GPS coordinates using anything less than a high precision thing, it actually took like seven or eight days that we would go and GPS those to get an average of where it was. Um, no, so, if you get a precision GPS unit, though, it it takes like three minutes. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, I know that Chris Elphick doesn't have one in his lab, but they have used them before for their, for some of their other studies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the only, the only potential issue we found is, um, and this was, I guess, five years ago now. Um, yeah. But the, the canopy cover made the, the high precision uh, units not as high precision as we needed. Um, yeah, and if we, if we had them out on the marsh, yeah, um, you know, at the at the transect zero point, but then um, two or three additional ones. Um, mm -hmm. I'm most concerned because once I start flying the drone and generating the ortho mosaic and 3D model, if I have some actual elevations to lock in on, mm -hmm. um, that that really makes the whole thing, um, you know, a, a realistic 3D model that could uh, maybe even be input. Um, into the SLAM model. And that'll be more, that'll probably be more, better, um, better elevation perfect. data than, than even LIDAR. That is perfect, yep. Okay, well then there is another, there is another point which uh, goes along with the, uh, the, the, the bird survey, 
stuff, and that is uh, the marker point at the uh, at the uh, the uh, fifty meter of um, uh, uh, site along that vegetative transect line. So that uh, you know that then that would be uh, uh, that would be that would be very helpful. I might put, might even put in a metal metal stake there for you know for uh, for for exactly this purpose. So right now, uh -oh. have, yes. Oh, Sharon, I, I mentioned I have a GPS that I use for sailing and race committee and stuff like that. Just that one point of using phones versus whatever, you all have to make sure your settings are on decimals, not, so we just, you know, we have to coordinate all that because people don't realize that there's two GPS versions. Right. Yep. So just as, as we all use devices, we just have to make sure we're all using the same uh settings so i'm going to bring my gps for that we use for sailing which is close enough i guess for backup work but there you go uh, sharon that gives you and that gives the readings and decimals yes yes yep okay because uh, that, that's the direction you know i i think we should probably go on this so okay. right okay this is perfect <laughs> exactly how i was hoping this would work out okay next slide please uh, in terms of the layout of the transect line, uh, the creek is on the left-hand side. Uh, if you'll notice that uh, then, uh, each of these little boxes here represents a, a meter quadrant up through 20. And now you can see them, how he's, um, uh, how he's enlarged it. And then uh, beyond that, uh, from it's um, every, every 10, Every 10 meters, you do one quadrant study. So um, uh, that's why I've, um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the, uh, uh, this is the data sheet uh, that, uh, that goes along with that. And the main point here is the plot, uh, plot numbers. And uh, from uh, basically, this is where the if, if, uh, the first stake of um, if, um, uh, if, uh, the, z the zero mark is is between v zero zero a and v zero one a, and uh, if it's uh, if, uh, so that uh, minus two is starting at the water's edge, uh, minus one is up against the stake, and then uh, the ones are you know. On the landward side of that stake, so these are the plot and the plot numbers which you would use for identification purposes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, here's an enlargement of that, and the key point here is um, the from, from the line will be stretched out from here to from here to here, but going backwards uh, from from the stake of uh, from, from, from uh, to uh, the minus one, that would be a one meter, and then and then uh, the blue box represents the uh, the one closest and closest to the creek. So uh, then you would start with that, and then proceed from there up to the stake, and then continue on. Next, <clears throat> when you get beyond the twenty meter mark, it's then uh, going thirty meter thirty meters. And that would be V03, V04, V40, V05, 50, V06, 60, and so forth. That would be that's how you would indicate the plots on the, uh, on the data sheets. Any questions on that? Okay, if you'll turn to this particular uh, sheet in your, in your, in your files there. Are there any questions about uh, you know what was what is presented in this? Uh, we've already done the staking out. Um, we will use the compass again to roll out the tape so that it uh, goes in a particular direction. And uh, for the first uh, 20 meters, we will be doing each each plot. Um, we're both getting the the animals, and we'll discuss the, the procedures. Later, once you get beyond the thirty, uh, from the uh, the the frame will actually go over 
uh, right over the, uh, the 30 meters and the 40 meters and the 50 meters and so forth. Correct, Chris? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> In order to take into account uh, vegetation population density, uh, the, uh, on the originally, if a plant or if, if a plant was found in the quadrant, you would put a one in the box. If there were if there were none of that plant in the box, uh, you put a, you'd put a zero. Uh, in order to reflect density. Uh, from I've uh, put it in in uh, in uh, in ten percent increments. So if they're from one to ten percent, that would be code one. So the actual entry would be a one zero one. The one the first one indicating that the thing was present, and then there were zero to ten percent or one to ten percent of that uh, from uh, plants available. Uh, two, it would be 102, and so forth, up to 100% would be 110. Any questions on that? Uh, here's a sample of showing how it would be recorded on the sheet. Uh, from, you know, if, uh, this is just a sample in which uh, Spartina alternaflora is the one that's, uh, that's closest uh, to, the, uh, to the creek. And this would be that, uh, this plot which is shown is a V00B, was that blue frame that was on the, on the enlargement before, um, at uh, minus two from the point, and uh, 100, um, and there was um, a one Spartine alt in the flora, and there was 100% of it. In the next plot, no, in, in the next plot, 30% um, of that was covered by the Spartina patens. 70% was um, covered by Spartina alternaflora. Any questions on that? So these two numbers ultimately have to end up as, as 100%. Yeah. Uh, setting up the transect, next. Uh, these, are the, these are the tools. These are the two stakes that were put in the ground. This is the compass we use for measuring the, the distance. Uh, here's my housekeeper and so forth. Uh, uh, this is run out in the fields, you know, behind the school, which I live near in Orange, just as a demonstration of uh, what the process is about. So. Okay, uh, hold it right there. Uh, that's Nadia way back there at the zero end. This is the 100 meter end. That's to give you a perspective of the distance that 100 meters is. So you get a feel for what we're involved in. Uh, then we put in these. Uh, we obviously we're you know we're not concerned about being straight. We're, as, as I say, just demonstration. So these um, pegs were put in at uh, 25, 50, 75, plus the zero and the hundred. Next. <clears throat> this is the first quadrant, and this would represent the stream. The stream back here. So this would be the V zero zero B uh, quadrant. Next slide. That's the A and that's the A. Next slide. And now we are in the, in the next quadrant. Now, an issue here, uh, Chris, is um, when we get up into the area where the Phragmites is, um, my thought is, taking uh, one side out of the frame and sliding the frame, the, the what's left of the, the U-shaped frame uh, into the vegetation at that point along the tape. 
to get the to get the standing vegetation, to get the you know this the standing vegetation is, is is what's being measured, not that which has been trampled by walking along the side of the tape. Yeah, that's that's what we tried to do. We made sure that the the quadrats could be pulled apart so that we could kind of wrap it around the standing vegetation. Yep. And we tried every time we did one of these surveys, we tried not to tread the same path and, and not tread also on the too close to the transect line. Right. Uh, next slide. Okay, the actual order of processes to be completed. All right. I should begin with a bird survey. Uh, and we'll be discussing the, uh, the SOP on that shortly. Um, once that's underway, then we'll start with the, uh, the aquatic organisms in the creek. And at the same time, we can then do uh, for the quadrant sampling, you know, which will begin with uh, from, you know, uh, sweeping for insects, looking for nest gold burrows. After you've uh, completed the, uh, the insect work, then we'll go for the plants. And then uh, as appropriate, uh, Scott and the team will be doing the drone flights um, mm -hmm, over the transect. Uh, if you would uh, take your publications and look through the bird, uh, uh, bird survey standard operating procedures. Uh, John, you want to mention anything specific about these? John? Still have John with us? Yeah, Carl, can you hear me? Yep, you're good, okay. Okay, yeah. um, as I was saying, as I read through it, it was important to note that when you're going through the bird survey that you wanna be sure that you, if you see a bird uh, and you count it, you have to make sure that you only count it once. If that bird gets up and flies 50, meters away and lands back down in the survey area, you don't want to count it again. Uh, so that's why um, I was reading that two people are, are helpful to do the survey, one to record, one to observe. And that's uh, the two people on each line. And uh, in, the, in, the diet, in the circle there, uh, there's that center point. That center point is going to be at the 50 meter uh, spot. Along the trans uh, along the vegetative transect line, uh, that's where we do the quadrant sampling, and then those other lines uh, from the one to the right uh, was basically the path that uh, uh, we cleared to get out to put in the original stake. Uh, I think uh, John, uh, we need to make some arrangements to uh, uh, perhaps get out and okay and see what we need to do to, to clear a pathway for the. Uh, for the line to the left and then the marking on both ends uh, as it indicates flagging. So uh, what do you suggest we use for flagging? Uh, we can use uh, something like that orange landscapers uh, or uh, surveyors tape. Okay, uh, and just get some wooden stakes and put the wood, put the tape on the wood. Um, yeah, I think that would work. Uh, we want something, we're gonna leave the stakes out there, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe or just, we are just maybe putting in from more of them. Uh, I remember from, uh, from, uh, from Bo had mentioned he's got some more of the, uh, the and then and, and, uh, as, as Zane mentioned, he has some more PVC pipe that is uh, this taller. Maybe we could uh, put the flagging tape on, on on those pipes and put them put that PVC pipe in at the ends of these transects. That would be a good idea because uh, it would be more durable than wood, obviously. Yep, yep. If they're, okay. if these are going to be out there for a long period of time. Right. <laughs> I'm just well, wondering. Where we're, I just wonder when we start wading in the water to get out to the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Be seventy-two inches high, right? Right. <laughs> uh, if, uh, anybody have any questions about the procedures? Uh, Carl, are, are we going to be doing these simultaneously, like first on the same day, I should say? On the, the bird right, uh, and then, then we'll then have the to go out the, uh, 
I have to gonna do day one. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, Chris Field. What do you think? We we always did them on the same day because we had uh, about two hundred of these to do, so we couldn't we couldn't travel back. Um, the only thing that was really important is that the birds get done before we spend the whole day in the area. So once once the bird surveys were done, then we would usually go right to the vegetation transects. Yep. Okay. How long does the bird survey typically take, Chris? Um, I believe ours are a five minute count. So we would travel to the point, and uh, I'm not sure if this is exactly in the protocol or not, but we would usually wait five minutes or so for things to calm down. Um, yep. And then we would do the survey. Um, it's either five or 10 minutes. Um, and so, yeah, that, it didn't really take long at all. Um, I would just second what you said, that having a second observer is very useful for recording. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, my vision was that uh, uh, there would be two people along each line, which would uh, go together, as it mentions in, uh, in, in, in day two there, so that uh, you know, there, was, uh, there was the observer, and then there was the recorder spotter, who might pick up on some that uh, you know that other than that the uh, the, the, the designated observer might have not not have seen because he was looking in the other direction at the time. Okay, no other questions, comments. We should only mark birds that we see within that quadrant within that survey area. Right. Uh, following positions. Coordinator, which would be John, <laughs> yep. and then the and then they and then it's at, uh, the two observers and two recorders, so five people. Janet, based on your experience, uh, from your thoughts on the subject. Janet? Sorry, I'm muting myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat that? No, it is, uh, if, um, after, after, after reviewing that and listening to the discussion, uh, anything you want to add to uh, what either John or Chris has said based on no, your- No, not at this time. No, I'm just uh, trying to absorb all of this. Yep. But, uh, not at this time. Uh, so Steve has not come back with anybody else to help uh, who is uh, from, going to be covering the other uh, the other regions near you right not that i'm aware of john did uh, steve come back with anybody to you no he did it has not okay all right uh, then we get into the uh, the quadrant sampling and uh for, there will be three groups uh group a will be from from from, from the creek up to a 10, B will be 11 to 20. Next slide. And then we go 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 for group C. So basically group A has two more quadrants than group B or group C. Okay, next slide. Uh, on the left is the insect in the sweep net. Uh, and then uh, uh, you'll have a dish pan where you can dump the stuff that's in the, uh, for, in the insect net. Uh, you'll also have a dish pan for the aquatic stuff. Um, and that's with the hand strainers and that, uh, that uh, aquatic D net has a very long extendable pole on it to be able to get out in the water to collect the. Okay. Uh, Dennis, we will have uh, the, mic uh, uh, the, the microscope to use. Yes, you will. 
Uh -huh. That would be good. Uh, can we set up two tables out there as, as workstation? In the marsh? Um, kind of in the, of, and of, um, maybe in the, of, of, um, you know, up in the, up in the meadow there at the, uh, at the, at the head. Yeah. The only, the only thing is that, uh, it's hard, it's hard to, to see the display in uh, bright sunlight. Okay. So. Maybe we say that for the barn then? It's probably better that way. Okay. Any questions on these? Next slide. Carl, are we doing this at a specific uh, cycle of the tide? Are we doing this at low tides? Uh, it's when the tide and tides going out and then coming back in. So that's the middle of the day. It's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's um, middle of the day it's uh i've tried to time it so it's at uh, low tide so the, it's most beneficial to do this at low tide is that what right you're yep okay, okay. It's, uh, if it's high tide uh, you would be waiting in the water we'd all need waiters <laughs> right, right okay <laughs> yep I tried to time it that way okay that's why if uh the 26th is rainy the next, uh, the next time that we are in that tide, appropriate tide cycle, is going to be October 10th. So, okay, that's why that's then that's establishes rain date. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on equipment? Okay. I do not yet have the beating sheet and beating stick. Uh, maybe between now and then I'll be able to uh, fabricate one out of an old bed sheet. <laughs> okay, uh, Chris, uh, from, can you fill us in on this? Uh, this is Uh, answer anybody's questions on, on, on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, if anyone has any specific questions, the, the tree mortality one um, should be pretty straightforward. Um, the only part that's a little bit difficult is measuring the proportion of crown dieback. Um, but um, we thought that that was a, a much less important parameter for us to be um, collecting over really big scales. But if we wanted to get a, a better handle on that for this uh, more limited uh, application of this, uh, I'd be happy to help think through that too. Okay. Uh, from, are, you, are you gonna be available on the, uh, from uh, next Saturday? Uh, yeah, I can try to be available next Saturday. Um, I just have to check my calendar. That would be ideal. <laughs> Chris. Can uh, the crown dieback be measured by th with the drone? Uh, I think it could be measured better by the drone than by humans on the ground. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Uh, we don't. We don't. I mean, as far as using this information to compare to any work that we've done in the past, we don't have very good crown dieback estimates, except from remote sensing and things like that. Um, and so, but in terms of uh, getting some good information for better understanding what's happening at East River, it, it might be useful to have some on the ground measurements, but we, uh, we didn't really find a good way to do it. Um, that could be consistent between observers. It's a, it was a tough thing to do. Um, we were following the forest inventory and analysis protocols, um, but we didn't feel uh, very good about the information we were getting. So I think that drones would be a much better approach. Carl, I have a question to Scott Kahn over here. Yep. <clears throat> if you, you're going to do a, a check on the trees along the, the transit line back. Now there's a, there's a large field, there's an 11 acre field there before there's any trees that come into play. 
Uh, how does that how is that work uh, in this particular case? Yeah, I've, um, I've, actually, the transect line uh, runs into uh, runs out of the marsh up alongside that um, that, uh, that big huge tree. It's actually got about four trunks uh, from uh, to, uh, to the entire tree, and stops short of the of uh, the of the trail, right by birdhouse number nine. Okay. So it's basically just uh, then uh, the big tree, and there are a couple of small trees which would be on the other side of of the transects. And when you're doing the measurements, you have to uh, you have to give. You know, measure how far away from the transect line, uh, in in perpendicular uh, perpendicular direction, uh, <clears throat> the specific tree that you're recording the information on. So, okay, uh, we're working with uh, both that on the ground and also from, you know, what we can do with the uh, 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 the drone. I think uh, we might be able to come up with some good data on this. We don't have a large number, but. <laughs> You know, it's, it's something to follow for a while. Hey, Carl, this is Scott Graves yep. uh, piping in. So I remember when we were down there, um, when we were hacking our way through the Pragmites, um, there was a substantial step down onto, onto the marsh surface. Um, you remember that? It seems like it was about 18 inches high. Is right. that, that's where we first cut through. I don't. I don't know if that same step was was apparent on the actual transect line, starting under the trees. Um, but if it is, we should we should trace that out and record it. Uh, yes, we would. We would have to. We would have to mark that, and I would have to go in in, in the notes. You know exactly when that uh, change in change in slope takes place. Okay. Um, Question for you, uh, Chris Fields. Um, maybe we should be measuring slope on this. Uh, I, I mean, slope measurements would be really great. Um, we we don't have a good way. We we did not work out a good way to measure slope. Um, and again, I think that's that would be more of a getting good elevation measurements from a drone. Um, and getting slope from that rather than a, a field measurement. We tried a few. We tried a few methods, but we didn't find anything that is realistic um, to do in any kind, like in in one day. Um, but if so, anyone idea, that's great. Um, I'm I'm wondering. So I did an experiment once. This is Scott Graves again. I did an experiment once. I have a a couple of GoPros with big fat batteries on them. And uh, I set them on a stake that had a, um, a meter stick on it as well. And I left it out on the marsh taking time-lapse imagery as the tide came in. And I was able to actually record the maximum inundation depth um, without even be, without, you know, waiting around all freaking day to be there. So maybe I'll bring that and we could leave it there and somebody could pick it up in the late afternoon when the tide was high again. That would be very good. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. We we did a lower tech version of putting washable marker on a dowel and sticking it in the ground and coming back for it. Um, but we don't have any like widespread data on that. But the GoPro is, is a much better way to do that. This is all coming out uh, coming together very well. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> yep. Okay. Any questions on on this slide or? Yes, uh, this yep. is Diane. Go ahead, Diane. Yep. Hi, I just see a typo about the tree ID guide. Um, it mentions guide to birds. What right. is the recommend? <laughs> is there a recommended one? Just two questions. Is there a recommended one? And will the project be providing all the guides, ID guides for all the species? Uh, I do have. I do have a whole have a whole set uh, of. Um, the uh, the field guide that uh, Patrick Lynch um, has is, um, is is excellent. Uh, even more so is uh, the guide that uh, uh, Juliana Barrett has put out, and, and, and 
uh, towards the end of the presentation, we have uh, uh, a link that you can actually uh, check out uh, her guide and uh, familiarize yourself with the, you know, with with the, with the plants that are uh, shown in the uh, in the in the uh, transect. Because uh, in some of the cases, there were only the Latin names for them. So eventually, I think uh, maybe we change that uh, sheet, Chris, to include uh, both the and the common names for those. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, uh, that should, that is a typo. It should say the Sibley guide to trees. Um, and we, we had that because it's set up the same way as the Sibley guide to birds. So we could have mixed crews. Um, but any, any field guide is good. We also took, um, leaf samples if there was a particularly hard, um, tree. Um, and then we would identify it later or we had people in the collections help us if it was like a hybrid oak or something like that. Um, but yeah, so I mean, any, any, any tree guide is good. Um, and I think the, the dividing line between tree and shrub, which I, I think, uh, might be in the protocol somewhere that we had chosen is just, uh, basically anything that is like, uh, I think it's called, uh, Amelanchia or Amelanchia. I don't remember. I don't know exactly how that one's pronounced, but Amelanchia and above is a tree and anything smaller than Amelanchier we, we didn't uh, include in this. Um, so that's just kind of like that cutoff line between tree and shrub. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I do have a very good uh, uh, from at, uh, 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 tree guide, mammal guide, uh, flower guide, uh, you know, plant guides and so forth. Uh, they will all be available there out, um, out at the site uh, on, on that day. So. Plus, we will be bringing them back to the uh, the barn, and you know we can uh, use the microscopes. Uh, uh, we've got uh, one uh, one one scope that we've uh, purchased, which uh, transmit the image to your to your cell phone, so that we can uh, look at it uh, uh, very closely. And the other one is a regular uh, dissecting scope, which. Uh, I managed to uh, pick up from uh, from the uh, microscope uh, repair man when I was teaching out in Guilford. So, any other questions on this uh, transect uh, study? Okay, next slide, please. Um, tags. Uh, what would you suggest, Chris, for tags? Uh, well, we had just used uh, standard forestry tags. Um, we didn't do, I mean, um, yeah, standard forestry tags that we had the numbers recorded for, and we gave it about uh, five inches of distance in the nail between, um, just to give the tree room to grow. Yeah. Um, but that was it. Um, and I think... We brought we bought pre-stamped tags, um, but we had a stamping kit, and I think we stamped the word Yukon on it, um, just in case there were other tree tags from other studies. Right. But we didn't find any in our. Well, I'm uh, I'm dealing with the forestry suppliers now on a bunch of this other equipment. In fact, uh, uh, I was just talking to them yesterday. Uh, finding out uh, why I haven't received the uh, stuff I ordered back a month ago. And they told me, uh, well, there was one thing that was back ordered. Uh, so, you know, we're going to wait till it came in. I said, I need the stuff on Saturday. Please chip out what you got. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> but the question is, uh, can you give me a recommendation of uh, what we should uh, look at for tags? And of, um, I'll reach out to them. We won't have them there for this Saturday, but, uh, you can always go out when they come in and put them on the tree at that time. So. I think we bought them from forestrysuppliers.com. I think, yep. um, I think we got all of our, our tree supplies from there. Um, yep. I could also uh, email or call Chris and see if there's any from our study that are left over in the lab um, that could be used, but mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't know. So much has happened. Um, <laughs> 
Tell me about it. You, know? uh, <laughs> yep. you can't, yeah, I, I don't, you can't exactly just walk into the lab anymore. And right. Yep. <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was talking to uh, the guy that I helped uh, build the sound school with uh, back in 96 to 206. And, uh, you know, and I said, uh, well, you know, when I, uh, can I come in and look around for some of this equipment that I'd uh, like to be able to use for, for these studies? He says, yeah, we got to have a uh, really, really tough uh, protocol here. So, you know, let's get together on Monday and uh, we'll set up a time <laughs> so I can go around with you and provide you with all the stuff and all the wipes and so So <laughs> I know, I know what, uh, what that's like. So, okay, uh, if any questions on the sheet here? Next slide. All right, in terms of the information, there will be the field data sheets, which we will be, uh, when they're filled in, I have um, a, a file system uh, set up here, um, which will, I will be leaving the barn um, for, uh, once you come in from the, from the field work to uh, put, them, put them in these files. <clears throat> so that uh, each time we go out, we'll you know we'll be able to add add to the files to uh, accumulate all of the data. And then uh, the other question I had for you, uh, for Scott, was uh, on the on the uh, on the computer program that uh, we had talked about earlier. Uh, is that format which I had uh, indicated uh, with the uh, with the percentages on it? Um, is there a way of entering that uh, that kind of data into into this program? Um, I'm not sure which program you're referring to. Um, seems like uh, are we are we talking something beyond a basic spreadsheet? No. Um, yeah, I guess we should decide decide where the data is going to be. <laughs> going to be stored um, long term and maybe you know there can be multiple copies of of it um, my concern is I'm probably just a couple of years away from retiring mm -hmm. so um, I don't know and we'll see who's going to be taking the position uh, after me but I can't guarantee that they're going to um, uh, be interested in maintaining or even participating in this project. I would hope so, but not quite sure. Well, maybe Robert would help persuade him. <laughs> Carl, this is Susie. I can't fly a drone, but I'll be around for a, a long time. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> there, <laughs> there we go, Scott. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think, you know, it shouldn't be too hard to find uh, uh, somebody who would would follow up with drone. Um, I, you know, I, I'm hoping that um, after I retire, I'm going to you know push really hard for uh, a physical geographer who's interested in in drones. I'm probably going to be leaving uh, a lot of drone equipment and a full drone lab that I've created there. So I would hope that they would be interested in a project like this and maintaining it. I mean, it's not really that much work. It's flying it a couple times a year and, yep. uh, and processing, but yeah. So Susie, would you like to get your uh, pilot's license? <laughs> I don't know if you want me driving those things, Carl. <laughs> I'm being Come on. <laughs> you um, saw how Scott was doing it the other day. <laughs> actually, when you, when you put the drone in mapping mode, it's flying itself. You, oh, you, right. it's, down. You, you can automate it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Better. Um, Carl, it's Heather Crawford. I'm Hi, thinking, um, and it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a long time since we worked together. <laughs> yes, it has. You're on board. <laughs> yes, um, I'm thinking that in terms of long-term storage for the data, if you haven't approached the town of Guilford yet, this mm. is something that should probably go into the town servers as a long-term data depository. Um, because the town's going to be there. Um, you know, we're all, 2100 is a long time away. I, I can't, even 2050, <laughs> I, I, I can't honestly expect to be here, but I think 
um, either the town or the state Department of Environmental, you know, DEEP, there's a, there's a, there should be something set up very early in this process where the data is going into an entity that is permanent. Okay, a good point. Uh, may I have to talk to Kevin, Kevin McGee uh, for this next week and uh, see what the I mean, I mean, we can set uh, Dave, up. Yep. Dave Kozak may be able to get you set up into the, the DEEP servers that pretty yep. easily. Um, but I'm thinking that it would be the town should be really interested in having the data as well. Well, if they're, they're going to be getting, uh, they're going to be getting copies of it. Uh, that's the main, so that, uh, you know, not only, uh, you know, for infrastructure, but also, you know, landowners and the Conservation Commission and so forth. So. It is Absolutely. appropriate that, uh, you know, in, in land trusts. So. Yeah, so it's very appropriate that they provide some, like, right. service. Right, that, that service, somewhere. yep. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a service for them, they can, they can right. have data. Exactly. Great contribution. <laughs> <laughs> As usual, thanks. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, from the issue on uh, for collection and keeping of samples, uh, my thought would be, uh, my, for my first preference would be to take photographs and then create an album of those pictures for each time from each, each season of the year that we go out. So over the years, there would be two albums and every year two more and so on and so forth. Uh, and then also, you know, to tying the, 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 the drone video in, in with that for, uh, so that we get, uh, you know, we'd be able to go back and-, and Okay, and, and I'm, just, I'm gonna come in with my Conservation Commission hat. Um, we've been using a um, app called EpiCollect, which we got information from, from Yukon. And so you can take it and, and again, if we can get space somewhere, everybody could just take their pictures, send them, it, they'd all be geo-referenced, um, especially if you take them with a cell phone, you could take them into EpiCollect and then they're all in the same place. You can set up a project. Um, okay, uh, uh, then, then, then Dennis may be able to provide uh, for, uh, some additional information uh, for, uh, which uh, we've looked into, uh, but, uh, that may be uh, for, uh, another better direction to go. So you're right. Yeah, it's it's a really simple app to use. We've had high school interns going out and collecting data for us, and you just take it, it downloads, and then once you have it all in one thing, you, it goes to our um, GIS person, and they turn it into a map for us. Okay. So uh, you, Dennis, and I have got to get together on this one. Okay. Uh, for, uh, these, the, for, this is uh, one of the 29 pages in the in the protocols which uh, Scott has provided us with. Uh, I just put it in there to let you know that uh, uh, we do have uh, these protocols. Um, I've made a hard copy uh, from, uh, for us for, for, for our file purposes. Our, have I made a hard copy? Yes, I have made a hard copy of this. Something I wasn't able to make hard copy of. <laughs> uh, and here is the, uh, the, the photo drone video log. Um, and uh, Dennis, you want to uh, Well, we may want to change this depending on uh, this uh, epi collect uh, what happens with that but uh, I would think one of the things we need to know is uh, the file names from the from your uh, cell phones or if you use a standard camera what uh, the file names would be for them um, and then the uh, the various data that you can uh, provide with this, uh, the plot ID and the, if you've identified the, the, the uh, plant or animal, what it is and who took the picture and so forth. But before this epi, epi collect, uh, 
I had uh, made a uh, a um, Google form to uh, collect the photos. And uh, that's the uh, URL to go to the to it. Um, I created a a, a um, Google user transact one at massboard.org. That's uh, Mununcatuck's, uh, one of Mununcatuck's domain names that uh, is the domain name for our uh, uh, Google Drive. And uh, the password is East River Marsh Migration Survey dash 2020. Tried to make it somewhat easy to remember. And when you uh, go to this site, you get uh, this form, which is a standard uh, Google form, which lets you uh, add images, um, and then uh, you can browse on your phone to uh, find the images. And uh, when you've got them there, upload. And uh, they're all stored on uh, on our uh, Google Suite site, and uh, there's plenty of plenty of room for them. So we could start with this, and uh, then if uh, EpiCollect seems like the way to go, we could just move them all over there. And at, the, at this point, where if you know we're mainly using the pictures to help with identification, uh, you know. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be some things that uh, people don't know what know what they are, especially when they're talking about insects, etc. Um, and uh, have been in contact with uh, uh, Dr. Gail Ridge at the uh, from, uh, Connecticut uh, Agricultural Experimental Station. Uh, she's head of the entomology lab there, and she said, uh, "Yeah, you provide me with." Uh, Ideally, specimens, uh, if not a lot of pictures from different angles of the, the same insect, because uh, on some of the insects, there are um, uh, specific things about uh, the leg structure, which are used to separate one species from another, <laughs> the same group of insects. So um, she's on board with us to, uh, you know, to. Uh, you know, to help with the identification. So whatever pictures we have, you know, uh, we would be able to be able to use. Uh, who will be the ultimate users of the information, landowners in the vicinity of the marshes. And uh, from when we began this program, it was basically the idea that uh, from the Nuketsuk Audubon Society would be the outreach uh, group to uh, reach out to the community to keep them informed about uh, you know uh, sea, uh, global warming and sea level rise in general and how it's going to impact them and then uh, from now it's been scaled back to uh, uh, from specifically uh, focusing in on those 60 landowners that are <coughs> right in the vicinity of the marsh in the areas that the marsh is apt to be able to migrate into. Uh, so that's, um, uh, that's where that stands at this point. In the presentation that Dave Kozak has put together, uh, which we're looking at uh, perhaps giving in October 21st, October 22nd, or somewhere in that vicinity is, an, is a Zoom program, uh, would be, if, uh, would be if, um, recorded and then perhaps put on uh, uh, again, both Guilford and uh, Madison uh, kind of community TV uh, broadcast uh, in a, a later time. So that's where that and that's where that's going in terms of the landowners. <coughs> the others are all listed there. So uh, events for the twenty sixth.
Uh, John, where if uh, so uh, at 12 o'clock is a lunch break. What we're looking at is uh, providing lunch for everybody. Uh, John, you want to uh, fill in some details there, please? Okay, can you hear me, Carl? Yep. Okay. So, um, what are we saying? There's going to be about 30 people? Uh, that's what it looks like at this point. Okay. So, I was thinking that maybe we could ma I'll make a run to Subway. I'll call them in advance. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could get 30 sandwiches, I imagine, from Subway, if that works for everybody. General consensus? There's also, there's also a uh, Jersey Mike's, which is now available, if anybody likes that, rather than Subway. Uh, where, are they where are they located, Scott? They're in Guilford. Uh, I think I'm They're by the Big Y. They're by the Big Y and Walmart. They're in between the two. Uh -huh. okay. I wonder... Um, <laughs> you know better than I do, Heather. <laughs> I go to that big I wonder, a lot with my mother. I wonder if they would deliver, if we ordered 30 sandwiches, if they would deliver. I could call them during the week and see. That would be good, yeah. I guess the, the tricky part would be selection of, you know, what kind everybody wants. That would get complicated. Well, how about if we uh, now, now are down to a choice of the uh, the most uh the most commonly uh purchased uh, uh limit to three and three choices yeah maybe like a chicken one a beef one and a vegetable one would that sound okay you should uh do a uh a survey of the people to find out if there are any food allergies or yeah if um you know you have any vegetarians or vegans right uh, I don't have the list of 30 people I don't know who they I don't have their email addresses and stuff can we do that at the end of this uh, yep this that's uh, that's uh, yep okay <clears throat> I've got uh, almost all of the emails um, we could uh, you know maybe have uh, um, uh, uh, I will give everybody mine so they could, uh, you know, send, send their uh, send their allergies or, or their, you know, or, or problems into me, and uh, you and I can coordinate on that on that list. So, okay. As far as uh, drinks go, um, I'm thinking, you know, especially with social distancing and trying to reduce contact between everybody, if everybody could bring their own beverage, whether they want water, or whatever it is they want. And uh, that way we're not sharing bottles and, you know, dispensing from the same containers into cups and stuff like that. Does that sound okay? It's okay with me. Okay. So we'll, we'll provide sandwiches and it's sandwiches, everybody. Sandwiches, chips. Yep. Sandwiches, chips. And, like and if everybody could bring their beverage of choice. Yep. If uh, you would like, uh, you could uh, enter in the chat now, uh, any thoughts you have on uh, sandwiches, food allergies, or whatever that's related to what we've just been talking about? And I'll I'll save the chat. Okay. Okay. Uh, looks good. Uh, any questions on uh, anything else on the uh, on the schedule? <clears throat> How are we going to, um, I'm not sure how everybody else feels about this, but as you know, my wife has cystic fibrosis and I have my own health issues. So I need to be able to social distance myself and I'm sure other people will want to do the same thing throughout the day as we get together. How will, will we be able to do that in the barn? How will that work? We're going to keep people separated. Uh, from, we'll just be bringing people in uh, for individually or if you know, in, uh, in very small groups to, you know, to, uh, for, to get the equipment out and, and so forth with uh, field stations and that kind of thing. 
Okay. And everybody will wear masks? Yep. Masks okay. are required. Okay. I will be wearing mine. I always wear mine every place I go, no matter where it is. <laughs> so. Right. Yep. Uh, I have a question Diane, from Diane Chudkowski. Yep. Will you be breaking uh, the groups up in terms of level of experience? I've had no field biology experience at all. I'm happy to be help in any way, but. Um, no, we're, we're, we're about to show how that's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> See? <laughs> Asking you shall receive. <laughs> this is the only place where you know uh, um, we'll make up this uh, this sheet. Uh, if, you know, if um, one of us will, you know, will we'll write in your name as you as you volunteer for a particular job, uh, for, and so forth. So you, know, you won't be working alone. You'll be working with at least two other people. So. This is, a, this is a learning experience for all of us, even me, so. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Any questions on that, uh, on, on, on that form? Okay. Uh, these are some uh, re references and resources. Um, uh, especially take note of uh, salt marsh plants of Long Island Sound. Uh, I'll give you a chance to uh, write down that uh, that particular link so that you can uh, from, uh, go on your uh, cell phones or computer and actually. Or just uh, take a picture of the screen with your cell phone, which is what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Heather. <laughs> I'm so way behind in technology, so <laughs> thank goodness for Dennis for putting all of this together for me. He's, he's, my, he's our IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so any other any other questions on those uh the only other one is uh, the uh, the four letter bird species code uh and uh chris uh fields on 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 the bird data sheets um, um your thoughts on maybe modifying those sheets so it would have both uh, space for the four-letter bird species and the common name. Yeah, then that would that would be great. Um, <clears throat> either or, I think the the alpha codes. The most important thing is um, when the data are entered into some kind of spreadsheet that they're associated with the common names. Um, but we had some crews that would only put the common names on the field data sheets and then would look it up and um, when they were entering it just to make sure they got it right. Uh, right. There's, there's a tendency to make up four letter codes because you think you know what they are. Um, but then there's so many conflicts, uh, like I think Carolina Wren, it has a lot of conflicts. Um, so. You'll have to, I, I, I have printed out all 26 pages of yeah, that works too. <laughs> of that guide, so I've I've got one hard copy. So maybe I'll maybe I'll, maybe I'll make another one for you know for yeah uh, for, for 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 people to be able to refer to. I'll put it in a note. When, put it in I was note. gonna I was going to edit that list to uh, remove uh, birds that are would never ever ever in a trillion years be found there. Okay, true. Uh, yeah, I could also, I, I'm pretty sure I have access to our data and I can probably just sort and get a list of the unique species that we, we saw um, just to, to give you a list of, uh, I mean, I, I know there's people on this call who know what birds are around coastal forests in Connecticut, so it's not a problem, but I can also give you a list of the, the list of species we, we saw. Um, it's not that many. Uh, could could you email that to uh, to, to, to John uh, Chris? So the yeah. Yep. Okay. That would be good. Okay. Any other questions or comments on resources or references? Next slide, please. Any other questions about anything? Carl, did you record this session?
and maybe forward it as part of the whole dialogue and training and stuff? Are you going to record it or did you not record it? Uh, it indicates that it is being recorded. Okay. All right, good. Right, right Dennis? I hope <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I see that ball is going around and around. <laughs> No, but um, also, if, um, as, as Susie had asked, that it be uh, recorded so she can uh, you know, share it with uh, you know, the, the rest of the students that are going to be uh, uh, coming from Southern uh, to work on this. Okay. okay. About this picture that's, uh, that's shown here, uh, basically uh, from in the middle on the right-hand side, uh, if you move in, there's kind of a, uh, from uh, like a log uh, uh, there, right at that log, it is actually the, uh, there's a creek that, yep, uh, there's a creek that starts in and uh, goes in uh, to the left, up into where the, where the tree is, yep, right up, right up through there. So where that log is, is where the, uh, the zero point is on our transect line. And then uh, it goes uh, up through to the left of all of this. Uh, the if, um, that's all Phragmites there. Where the pointer is now is where the uh, from where the path comes in to, to, to get out to that point. But that would also be the uh, the left hand uh, from, uh, from the left hand uh, from bird uh, survey uh, from uh, line. Um, so we've been, uh, uh, we have we still have to lay out the line on the other side to, to get up into uh, the other side. But those are the trees in the in the, in the background there that will be part of the uh, tree uh, tree mortality uh, from SS uh, studies. So subject. So it kind of gives you an overview of uh, you know where all the work is going to be done for the time being. Next slide. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Chris Fields and uh, Chris Elpick and and uh, Juliana for for, for um, helping me put this whole project together. For Dennis for for doing all the technical work here and helping me put the put the slideshow together. And thank all of you for becoming volunteers to to help get this project up and running. So.